Hi, everyone. Um, today, we're just going to talk a bit about uh, systematic reviews and what they are and sort of my experience to working on them. Uh, as a bit of an introduction, my name is Daniel Shi. I'm a, a fourth year medical student at Queen's University. That's in uh, Canada, in uh, Kingston, Ontario. Um, so I've done a, quite a few systematic reviews uh, throughout undergrad and through med school, as in this is kind of more of just a session sort of to share some tips and tricks that I've learned throughout the years. It's more of like a pass me down session uh, to help you along with your um, uh, journey to provide to uh, working on these reviews. And again, just as a forewarning, it's also like if you have a grad degree or if you've like uh, done a lot of projects in the past, you probably know a lot of these already. This is more meant so for people who are doing the first few reviews and want more familiarity with the process and also with some of the uh, tricks and software that you can use to speed up the process. Um, a lot of the times I know that these things aren't uh, normally adequately explained and sometimes you should probably expect you to know um, what to do. So this is kind of a good uh, resource I find. Uh, uh, to have for people to um, uh, work through it. So we're, we're sort of going through and I've provided a brief agenda here. Uh, generally, I'll talk first about what a systematic review is and what's the value for you to actually do one and how it could add to your profile. Um, and then like how you will direct the project by defining your research question, how you gather information through search strategies, how to screen the relevant data, abstract the data, and do a quality review of the included um, papers. Uh, lastly, I'll talk about what the timeline to publication to looks, uh, looks like at all. Um, I think it's important as well to understand how long it actually takes to publish before you decide to take on a review, uh, because then you'll decide um, whether you'll have enough time to sort of add this to your CV or use it for your uh, future career goals. And of course, the last thing is before we dive into is if anyone, if anyone has any questions or wants to um, uh, ask about something, feel free to just throw them in the chat or unmute your mic and just talk as then we can uh, sort of go through them. Uh, it's meant to be more of an interactive uh, session. Okay, so first of all, what is a systematic review? I think this is the most important thing because it, it tells you whether you even want to pursue one and sort of add this um, to your profile and whether it be useful for your career goals. Uh, so a review essentially summarizes the existence evidence, uh, existing evidence in the field. And this is important because a lot of clinicians and like professionals, researchers don't have time to go through all the individual trials. So having a, um, a review sort of gives the bottom line uh, for what these studies have shown. Uh, now, it's normally characterized as the strongest quality of evidence, but only if it's a systematic review. Uh, just a regular review doesn't do that because they didn't sort of find the information systematically and that could lead to bias because then you can sort of select what studies you want to include in your review. Now systematic review is a holistic and systematic search of the literature. Uh, this avoids that sort of bias and what it does is there's an established approach to sort of uh, how to decide which sites to include and also how to abstract the data. Uh, and that's done by some organization called Prisma. Uh, so I've linked the guidelines here if you're interested in clicking them and taking a look at it. And uh, by default, every study or every review that you do, uh, so sort of follow their uh, checklist uh, of what is done. If it's not done, uh, a lot of journals, when you submit to them, they call you out on missing these steps or skipping steps. Um, I think that systematic reviews are great for uh, undergrads and medical students to complete during their studies because of the nature of the commitment. It often can be done uh, in an online setting with some in-person uh, meetings. And more importantly, you control the pace of the project. The amount of work you put into it will determine if you get a final outcome or not. A lot of times, you know, with wet lab studies, like you have to wait for uh, sort of your mice to grow or your cells to grow and see what the results are. And that will determine if your project will be feasible or not. Like you need to put, you have to go into the lab every day. Systematic reviews generally are not like that. Um, uh, the way it's done is uh, it's a project that you work on and if you have more time to put into it, the better the outcome will be. Okay. So uh, diving in, let's talk about uh, sort of research question. A research question is important for uh, almost every uh, project that you conduct, not just systematic reviews. Uh, this will sort of guide what kind of um, uh, searches you conduct and which uh, databases you'll search as well. Uh, so it's important to really have a good research question before you go into starting a systematic review. And every research question follows the PICO format. You guys may have heard about this, uh, but generally that stands for population, intervention, comparator, and outcome. Um, so I provide an example here from a research project that I've done quite recently, and we looked at uh, sort of outcomes following traumatic arrest. And what that is, is uh, some patients, when they experience uh, severe trauma, uh, the different mechanisms can lead to their heart stopping. So this may include massive hemorrhage, may include obstruction uh, of cardiac output, and all those things can lead to arrest. And we want to look at what specifically were the outcomes in this patient population. So as an example, we could put the population up here as like patients who experienced traumatic cardiac arrest, 
what's the intervention? Intervention is CPR, is it worth providing resuscitation to these patients? And then in this case, we actually didn't have a comparator. So something to keep in mind is that not every study, research study will have all four of these components, but it's generally the guideline you want to follow. And then outcome we're looking at, specifically we're looking at neurological outcomes. We weren't looking at mortality, we weren't looking at other outcomes, we're looking specifically at neurological outcomes. So having that sort of defined and specific part of um, the research question is also important. So you can sort of narrow and limit the scope of what you're searching. So this, of course, builds the basis for your search strategy. And the best way to do this is always to clarify the research question with your PI or your supervisor before you move on to actually conducting the project. Because once you start conducting the project, it's kind of too late. Um, you should always uh, go ahead and have this research question established. OK. Um, another thing is that before you actually start, uh, once you have a research question, before you actually start searching literature, a lot of people actually don't realize there's some steps that you should take uh, before um, diving in. And this will save you a lot of time later down the road. It will also help you when you apply to or when you submit to journals, because a lot of journals more and more are starting to demand very specific things from systematic reviews before they accept uh, these reviews. And they'll often say, oh, if you didn't do this, like we won't, we won't consider your project. And this is a step, these steps have to be done before you start the review. Uh, the first thing, of course, is that you should do a quick search on PubMed and to ensure that your study doesn't uh, already exist. And if it is, is, your, is it different enough sort of you to justify adding uh, this project? And, and this is important for you to bring up to your PI as well or your supervisor because they may not be aware as well that the project or a similar project already exists. And you're really going to have to make the argument for it when you submit your project. Reviewers will say, oh, this project already exists. Why did you include evidence from that specific um, project uh, that's already been uh, published? So that's happened to me before. It's very important for you uh, to make sure that there's no similar study. And if it is, be ready to justify why yours is different. Uh, another thing is like, aside from already searching the published studies, you have to search studies uh, that are ongoing. And the way you can do that is going through a database called Prospero. And Prospero will have reviews that are registered to it. Um, that are ongoing. So people will say, if I want to conduct a project, for example, in traumatic arrest, I'll go on Prospero and register my review. Um, so make sure another project doesn't already exist and you're trying to beat someone else to the punch. Like that, that, that would um, uh, not be uh, ideal uh, for you. Um, and the last thing is actually to register your review to Prospero once you've taken the first two steps. This is very important. This is because it's now an absolute requirement in the top quality journals, like uh, journals like Lancet, journals like JAMA, they all require you to have this done beforehand. And it must be done before you start to review. Uh, because the idea of this is to prevent bias. Uh, you, pre, you sort of predetermine and pre-state what your research question and outcomes you're looking for are, so you don't change them later based on the results. So you have to sort of upload and write what kind of um, things that you're looking for on this platform to, and submit it and have them approve it before you actually um, start uh, the review. So it's always good to sort of have that going in the background. And then after you've submitted it, then you can um, uh, start your review. Okay, uh, so let's talk about search strategy and information sources. And this is sort of the next step where um, after you've already set your question, you've registered it, and then now the question is, where am I going to get uh, results or information to sort of start my uh, review? Uh, and the idea is that for it to be a systematic review, you have to search particular databases. Uh, and the databases are usually well established as into which ones should be searched for clinical projects. Um, one thing that your supervisor will probably suggest is set appointments with your research librarian. Uh, so this is always recommended because they, uh, librarians know the best on which databases to use and how to create your search strategy. But one thing you should also do is to have a good understanding of what you're doing before you go meet with the librarian. And if you already have a draft of your search strategy sort of done, you get way more out of the meeting and the librarian can give you specific advice on how to improve uh, your project. Um, a good search strategy will balance sensitivity and specificity. And what we mean by that is that um, you want a search strategy that captures as much of the existing literature that's relevant to you as possible so you don't miss literature. But you also don't want too many results because then that creates more work for you later on. It'll make the, a timeline that's almost impossible to complete um, because you may spend uh, like months and months screening papers and there's so many other steps and you don't want to get caught up on that. So generally as a guideline, of course, it'll vary per project depending on how, many, how much literature there is. Um, in your specific field, but you want to aim for less than 1,000 results per database, depending on your topic. Um, and the reason for that is that if you search for a database and you get like 4,000 results, like it's already a lot of um, papers for you to go through. So you always want to get less than 4,000 um, in total. And keeping in mind that there'll be some nice duplicates between your databases, and that can cut down your number significantly. Because those st studies will be indexed in both, for example, in uh, PubMed, but also in Embase. So that'll be great. You can eliminate those uh, studies. Um, 
So under 4,000 uh, is, is generally the number I would say you should aim for when you do a systematic review, depending on, of course, how many team members you have and what the existing literature in that field is like. Usually you can check if your strategy is good as well, and this is sort of testing uh, the sensitivity of it, is if the, your supervisor will send you a few articles that they know are relevant. Because they're experts in the field, they'll say like, oh, like I know these articles are uh, what we want to include. And then you can sort of search the results of your databases to see if you've got those studies. And if you've got those, um, then that means your review is usually pretty sensitive. And the librarian will also help you do that and recommend uh, the same thing once you meet with them. Okay. Okay. Uh, the most commonly used uh, databases are on the Ovid platform, and it, you most, most of the time you'll have access to them through your university. Like here at Kingston and Queens, they give us access to Ovid uh, because you pay for that in your tuition. And usually most universities in Canada and U.S. should do this for you. Um, and on Ovid, there's some databases that you should know about. Uh, the most common ones are the three I've listed here. So they're Medline, Embase, and Central. And these are kind of the databases that most people will search for most systematic reviews. Um, they're all slightly different because of some um, uh, marginal differences, but the idea is that not every study um, is indexed uh, in all three of those databases. So it's a good idea to search all of them. Um, so for example, uh, Medline also covers most medical and biomedical journals. Um, it has the advantage of specific guided um, search heading uh, strategy, uh, search uh, subject headings uh, searches. Uh, so that will help you um, sort of uh, limit your strategies in a way that might not be available on other databases. So it's always standard to sort of search Medline. Uh, the second one to search is Embase. So Embase is a much larger database uh, than Medline, but it's also one of the standard ones that you really need to search as well. Um, and I've given you the options that you can use. Uh, there's a lot of presets on there. I'll tell you like how far, how many years back you should go. You should always be using a 1947 to present option. Um, at least uh, I found so in my um, experiences. And the last one, Central. This is a good one to search because it's a smaller database. It doesn't add too much, uh, too many results, uh, but it's always good for ongoing trials and existing reviews. And then, of course, outside of Ovid, you, you also want to search more databases. So in, in almost every clinical uh, review, you want to search Embase and Medline. That, that's for sure, plus or minus central. Um, but you also want to go outside of Ovid if you can. And the main one to look at is PubMed. If, if you don't search PubMed, reviewers will comment on it. And I've had that happen to me, uh, where they said, oh, why didn't you search PubMed for a specific review? It's pretty easy to add in. And then because a lot of it is overlap with Medline, it's not 100%. Uh, but uh, it's, I would say, maybe like 60 70% is overlap with Medline. Line, and that's totally fine. You can just remove those duplicates. It doesn't add too much work to you and you avoid that question from the reviewers later on. And you also give uh, the impression that you've created a more systematic uh, search. So definitely want to search PubMed and they have their own um, sort of platform for you to enter a search strategy in. But once you've already built your search strategy on um, Ovid, Embase, and Medline, you can sort of use the same one uh, for PubMed. And other ones to consider are uh, databases that are specific to your project. So example, uh, uh, CINAHL is useful if you need allied health evidence. So this is great. Uh, for evidence from uh, nursing, OT, PT professions. If that's relevant to your topic, you should definitely search that database. And then ProQuest is good if you want to get great literature. So if you want to get ongoing projects, master's thesis, et cetera. Uh, generally, I don't search ProQuest unless you're looking specifically to include some great literature or if you're out of literature from uh, other topics, you don't have a lot of studies included. And the last one is web, uh, web science. Web, web, web science I almost never use. Like this one, um, is only really if you don't have literature because it includes a lot of basic science research unless you're interested in that particular field for your project and it retrieves lots and lots of results so it'll take you a long time to go through them uh, so typically i almost never use this um, but uh, it is useful if you we need to broaden the scope of what you're looking for okay and of course the more databases you search the better like because this is makes your project more robust but keep in mind it also creates more work for you later down the road and you have to keep in mind what is feasible and like what kind of impact you want to achieve uh, so that's kind of um, the balance they're looking for uh, when you uh, recruit databases and sort of like choose which ones you want to search okay uh, so, so now that you know the databases and information sources out there, like what is sort of the method to search them? Like how, how do I search these databases? Like it's, it can't be like Google. It's not like uh, I search on Google, like for example, a traumatic arrest and I get like results. It's way too broad of a scope. So the way it works is that uh, 
for search strategies, what you can do is you can use either keywords or something called mesh terms to sort of narrow down and limit uh, the, the scope of what results you're retrieving. And it's kind of like multiple Google searches combined into one. And there's two major functions that you're going to use uh, to sort of combine these terms. You can use either the and function or the or function. And it kind of is, is what it sounds like. Um, so for example, is um, it's on Google, you searched, uh, I wanted to search arrest and I wanted to search trauma, but I only, I didn't want to find all sorts of arrests because um, if I just search arrest, I'll get like police arrests and all sorts of different um, other arrests that might not be related. I'll get medical cardiac arrest, specifically I want traumatic arrests. So in that case, if I want to search both those terms, I would combine the terms, I would say trauma and arrest. Now, if I want to search stuff that's like an or function, like let's say I wanted a trauma, I wanted to like car accidents or uh, stab injuries, and I want to get results from both, I would combine them with an or function. So those are kind of the most basic functions uh, that are used to create search strategies, like multiple Google searches that are combined into one. Um, and like I said, the main things are either uh, keywords or mesh terms. Uh, so the difference between them is that uh, uh, keywords uh, will retrieve studies that are mentioned in the text. If it's an abstract, it's in the title, it's in whatever, and mesh terms will, will be indexed to each particular studies. So the idea is that keywords will retrieve, uh, or in theory should retrieve a more broader uh, sense of literature, because it's mentioned anywhere like that, that in the title or abstract, um, it, it will bring it up. Um, but if you want a study that's specifically indexed to that topic, you want to search uh, the mesh term. Um, what most librarians will recommend is to do both. Is you, you should search the mesh term and the, or, the, or the keyword. You combine it with an or function. That way, uh, that'll help you um, get the most amount of studies without missing uh, any of these studies. Okay. Um, so uh, some other functions to know, and, and this, this will make more sense to people who have actually, actually done searches on Ovid or on um, PubMed. And basically um, what you should do as well for mesh terms is to make sure you select the explode command. And that'll capture all of the mesh terms that are indexed um, below the, um, that particular term. So for example, cardiopulmonary arrest is a, um, is, is a specific mesh term, but if you write it with EXP and then cardiopulmonary arrest, what it'll do is it'll capture all the index terms that are relevant under that term. The way that mesh indexes is that it will have specific terms uh, that have less results under it, and you want to capture all of those as well. Uh, for keywords, is sometimes you want to capture the suffixes. So for example, if you're looking for heart arrest, but for example, like some papers could say heart arrests or like with an S or like other variations of it, and you want to capture all of that, I don't, I don't want to miss the ones that just added an S to it. You can add sort of a um, star above it, and then that will capture all of the variations following uh, that. It'll capture all the suffixes. So those are useful things to know as well. Okay. So using the strategy that uh, using the strategy that we provided, um, you can sort of create groups of terms based on your uh, research question. You can combine them. So the way I would do it is I would create three groups, and then of those three groups, I would eventually combine these three groups with an AND function uh, to show uh, to get uh, specific results. But within each group, I would want to get all possible variations of that topic. So for example, in group one, if I was looking at cardiac arrests, I would look at all the ways you could say cardiac arrest. I don't miss those studies that use different words to describe arrest. Older studies may use asystole, for example. So I want to say. Uh, asystole or pulselessness, et cetera, et cetera. And then that will give me a large number of studies retrieving any study that mentions cardiac arrest or some form of arrest in whatever terminology they choose to use. Then I will use a second group to capture all the trauma terms. And then the last group I would use to capture my intervention, which is resuscitation. It's all based on my PICO question. And then after that, I would combine these three groups using the AND function, and that would build, build, build a, the basis for my search strategy. Um, one thing I would recommend is not to include a group for your outcomes. Like I could have included a group where I wanted the specific outcomes looking for. For example, I was looking at neurological outcomes. And the problem with that is that um, a lot of studies may report it as a secondary result. And a secondary result will be hidden somewhere in the main text. And the only way really to know that is if you read the main text. Uh, the search function won't capture stuff from the main text for the most part. Um, so if that is done, you may miss some important studies. And generally, it's not to look well upon. So if you miss these key studies, um, it's unlikely that reviewers go back to your search strategy and like, look, oh, you did you included outcomes, but more likely is it, what will happen is you might miss some important studies and don't realize that. And then that you, you don't want to do that. Um, so you definitely don't want to miss some of the key studies and to prevent that, you can just not create a group for your outcomes and sort through them manually. 
Okay. Uh, to help you out as well, like Ovid also has some limiters to reduce your uh, results. Uh, some of these include like you know, English language, animal studies, conference abstracts. This is great because you can sort of exclude any of the studies that are uh, obviously not relevant. Um, so for example, if you want to remove uh, all animal studies because you're only looking at human trials, then you can, there's a way to use that terminology. And I've put it up for you on the slide as well. You can sort of uh, work through it. Oops. Um, and figure out how to do it. Essentially, it's, it's pretty simple. All you do is limit the previous line, uh, which is your overall search strategy to animal studies, and then you write another line that says you want um, uh, 22 and not 23, not the animal studies, and that will re reduce all of them. Now, this is a bit tricky because like, sometimes if you do put too many limiters, you can remove studies again that you need. Um, some librarians specifically suggest not using the English language filter. I think this makes sense uh, because if you use the English language filter, uh, what happen, might happen later on is you might exclude those non-English language studies anyway, and it's better for rigor because then you'll say, oh, like I wasn't going to include them anyway, so there's no bias because there's a certain degree of bias included by that. But in, in, in other, like in, in feasibility terms, if everyone on your team, for example, only speaks English, then you're, you're going to eventually only include English language studies at the end of the day. And there's not much you can do about that. So if you have too, too many results, like 7,000 results, it's better to use this filter, in my opinion, than not use this filter. Okay, uh, now that you have the basic templates from all of that, you can sort of just transfer that database, that, that search strategy to all the database. You don't have to recreate the database, a search strategy each time for each database. So that uh, is why it's, good, it's a good idea to have a draft, go to the librarian, get some feedback, and then sort of work on the other bad databases. Some databases may be slightly different. They might have slightly different uh, measure indexing terms. Um, and then you're going to have to update these lines. Uh, so for example, Embase is different from Medline, uh, PubMed, and Central. Medline, PubMed, and Central are all the same. But Embase uses different mesh terms. So you don't have to change the keywords, but you do have to change the mesh terms to match the specific indexing terms that Embase has. OK, so you've gotten all of your uh, search results. There's probably like, and there's usually around hundreds to thousands, depending on how many um, or how many, how much people publish on that specific field that you're looking at. The next step you want to do is how do I remove all the duplicates? And you're not going to go through each of these studies and find which ones that are the same. It's, 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 too, it's too long. It takes too much work. The software I recommend to do this is something called Confidence. It's great. It's, it's a software that's actually developed by um, um, Cochrane, which is uh, the main center for um, systematic reviews and it's pretty well established. So it, they created this, this amazing software. Uh, while it's a paid, uh, Queens at least provides it for free uh, for its students. And I imagine a lot of universities might provide it for free because it might be included in your tuition. So definitely look into whether uh, they include confidence uh, in your uh, tuition fees. Um, and once you have that, and I've provided the link for you here so you can take a look at it later on, is that you can actually follow the steps on uh, that they provide on um, their software to upload the uh, results that you have from your databases. And when you upload the results, what they'll do is they'll automatically remove the duplicates. So that, that's great. You can see here that I've added results from many different databases. And at the top right here, you'll say they've removed like 2,100 duplicates. And if you click on that link, it'll let you see which duplicates were removed. And it'll basically only take one of the studies uh, from the, those duplicates across databases. Okay, so now that you have this uh, on confidence, like, and you have the duplicates removed, you have the final list, and you know how many studies there are in total. For example, you may have like 3,000 studies in total to go through. How do I actually screen articles in a way that's systematic? Uh, so, for example, um, if I were, like, for example, to only screen the uh, studies and select which ones are relevant, it's a little bit tricky because that may introduce some bias because then I'm deciding what studies personally I want to include. And, for example, there could be uh, some subconscious bias where I decide not to include longer studies exercises are more difficult to evaluate, et cetera. So like that, we definitely don't want that bias. Um, so the idea is to have one other reviewer independently screen relevant articles. And I think this is great. Uh, it's a great opportunity to sort of involve your colleagues or to involve your other students uh, in this project, provided that your PI agrees with it. Because sometimes supervisors request that uh, they have you use a specific reviewer. But um, usually they let you use people that uh, uh, that you would like, and it's a great opportunity for them to get authorship as well. Any reviewer should get authorship because they've worked on uh, the project. Um, so basically, the, the way to do this is that you and one other person will uh, screen and decide which articles are relevant um, based on only the title and abstract first, um, using your predetermined inclusion and exclusion criteria. You don't look at the full text in this stage. That would be too much. You only look at the title and the abstract, one or the other. Um, and you guys should screen like a few of them together first to make sure they're on the same page. This is usually around 50 to 100 articles, depending on how many results uh, you may have. And then after that, then you can independently screen your results and you can do that on confidence. Um, you can add anyone to your project on confidence as long as they have an email uh, 
address. They don't have to have a subscription or anything. And then once you add them, the Covenants will present both the article lists to you and on your computers or phones independently, you can both select yes or no. And it will flag anything that you guys disagree on. If you disagree on a specific study, uh, they will be gathered into a different list and you will both be able to access that later on and make a final decision. So this is great because uh, the software also uh, automatically decides which ones you agree and which ones you don't agree on. It's much easier to individually going through each of the studies that you agreed or dis disagreed on. Okay. And then the next step following that is to, uh, once you've done all of that, and once you've decided which studies you want to include based on title abstract, you'll have a much smaller list, but still a list that's too large for your, to include in your actual review. So the next step is to use screen articles using a full text. And this step, again, this will take a lot more time because you have to actually read the full text of a lot of uh, the included studies. And this again will require two reviewers. And, and the method I'm presenting here is not something that's, that I came up with, but it's rather the uh, Cockrunner Prisma way of doing things. You must use two reviewers at each stage and you must follow these two steps for it to be the proper systematic review uh, process to eliminate the bias. So this again requires two reviewers as the kind of the same deal, the only difference being that you're looking at the full text. Um, the nice thing about confidence again is that it'll automatically record or the articles that, you, uh, that were not excluded in the previous step. Uh, before you get started though, you probably want to find the PDFs for each article so you don't have to look for them each time you uh, screen the articles. So like one thing to do is you can use Google Scholar or PubMed uh, to find the full PDFs of these articles and upload them to Covenants as well. There's also a feature for that. Um, like before, you want to screen a few articles together uh, and this is going to be around 10 to 20 uh, articles. It's less this time because you'll have less, less literature at this stage to work with. Um, how the difference from title abstract is that you'll also have to record the reasons for exclusion at this point. Um, so for example, if you exclude the articles based on outcome not reported or like full text not found, then you'll want to re report how many were excluded based on each one. So example, 10 for outcome not reported or two for full text not found. And you'll want to come to an agreement on what, what order the reasons should take so they don't have disagreement uh, between reviewers uh, for the reasons for excluding specific papers. Okay, so I've created an infographic and that summarizes what I just talked about in the previous slides um, to help sort of summarize it. Uh, so the first step would be title abstract, of course. Again, you should always use two reviewers at each stage. And then you should first screen uh, 15, uh, 50 to 100. And because this is larger, number is a lot larger because there's a lot more literature at the stage. And you want to check your agreement as well. That's something I didn't mention before, but you should always check your agreements by calculating something called a Kappa score. And you can do that using how many studies you agreed on and how many studies you disagreed on. There's a lot of online calculators that will help you do this. And it's important to report that number in the paper as well. Uh, after that, you can resolve uh, your conflicts because you won't agree on all 100% of the articles that you choose to include or exclude. And if there are disagreements, you either can resolve by discussing with each other. It's like, oh, like I, the reason why I excluded was this, the reason why I excluded was this, and see if you come to agreement. And if you can't, you usually use a third reviewer. And this is usually your supervisor, your PI will come in and take a look at that particular paper. Uh, and then you also want to calculate the overall kappa. And you can do that based again on the number you agreed upon and the number you disagreed upon. Then you can progress to step number three, which is the full text review. And again, same deal, uh, you're using two reviewers, but you're screening a lot less this time, but using the full text. And you'll want to uh, predetermine reasons for exclusion and record the numbers that correspond to them, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, finally, you resolve conflicts in the same way for two different title abstracts. Then in your actual paper, you what makes it a paper is, is this flow diagram. And this flow diagram is a standardized uh, sort of a way to present these results. So you will be using the same thing that I've shown here, only with different numbers. Um, and the way it works is that it takes you through the process that you did. Um, so you're transparent with uh, how you selected your literature. And then uh, for the full text, it'll show exactly how many I didn't include based on um, specific reasons. So I've included uh, a, a good example for you guys here from the previous project that I conducted. And you also note that at the very end here, I've included uh, 40 studies in total, uh, but there's also a sec another box for studies included in the qualitative synthesis or the quality review. Sometimes you don't assess the quality of all the included studies, so that's why I've had an extra box for that. Okay. So finally, you've gone through the entire process, which can be long and sort of tedious of selecting the exact papers that you want to be included in your project, and then you can start to analyze the data. So I know it seemed like a very long and, and annoying process to get here, but it, it is important to sort of remove uh, the bias and to ensure a review is systematic. Um, and that allows your review, that differentiates the review from just a review or a survey of the literature to actually becoming a systematic review. And it's deemed the highest quality evidence uh, that's out there uh, because it's the most reliable. 
So when you actually do data abstraction, this again is a very systematic process. And, and what you should do is first create uh, an Excel table um, with the parameters that you wish to extract. And, and this, this is usually a, a good to review with your uh, supervisor because then you can make any changes now before you start to abstract the data and it becomes too late. So it's usually like I collect data based on some broad categories. Um, the first would be like um, some general information about the study. Like, um, so you want to study ID and the ID is usually done based on their first author in a year of publication. Uh, so example of like if Puneet published a paper in 2013, I would go Trivedi 2013 and that would be the example of uh, of the first uh, of the ID that I would use for uh, that particular study. Then I usually also collected study design. I think this is important because that'll help shape your, um, help you categorize studies based on either how you want to present the results or how you want to assess the quality. So you want to know if it's prospective uh, cohort, you want to know if it's retrospective cohort, is an RCT. So that's, I think that's always important to collect. Um, and also the location setting, like sometimes you can choose to collect that, sometimes you don't. Um, that might be important depending on your review, because sometimes it's interesting to see like if there's a difference based on the region. So do studies in Europe show a different result from your studies in um, uh, the uh, U US, for example. Okay. Um, we also want to collect information based on patient population. So a patient population essentially collects demographics uh, of this included papers. And that's important too, because you want to look at potential confounders that could have res resulted in uh, the results they found. So age, gender, comorbidities, et cetera. Those are some standard things to include. And you can decide what's relevant based on your specific topic with your uh, supervisor. You also want to collect the intervention. Uh, so for me, for example, I collected studies that did whether they did uh, closed chest CPR or open thoracotomy. And then also finally the outcome is are you using primary uh, or secondary outcomes uh, from these uh, specific papers. Okay. Uh, the parameters that, that you choose to collect may either be uh, free text or it can be like presets. Uh, so for example, a preset is like if you want to write the number one for retrospective study design, number two for prospective, and three for RCT. This is good to let you uh, to be able to use Excel to sort of uh, summarize the numbers toward the end. Um, one function you can use is the count if function. So if you have written out the function for you to use here, and it will automatically count how many, uh, for example, like closed chest CPR studies you've included. So you don't have to count each of the individual um, results from each study at each time. You can just use Excel to do the work for you. Okay, I've also included an example of what the Excel list uh, would look like. Ideally, data abstraction should be done based on two independent authors again. Now, this is a lot of work because then you have to go through the entire table. You have to say like, oh, did I um, collect, uh, did I agree or disagree with you? I need to resolve all the disagreements. Um, generally, one author is okay, um, as the guidelines don't really require two reviewers, but you must note this in your method section as well. Um, if you have time, I would definitely do it with two reviewers. Okay. So now we'll talk a bit about the quality review. So a good quality review is, is actually like before it wasn't uh, as mandatory, but now it's quite mandatory as most journals are looking at, at it because systematic reviews while you're there, while you've collected the evidence, you should also assess what is the reliability of these results. Did this, the results that I, did the information that I extract from these studies, were they good quality studies or were they bad quality studies? And you do that by assessing how much bias was in those studies. So this must be done with two, two independent reviewers. Again, you can't do it um, uh, by, your, by yourself. So the way it works is that you can use certain pre-established tools to assess or grade the quality of these studies that you included. Um, and the choice of your risk of bias uh, tool will depend on your uh, on the design of your included studies. If I'm looking to assess non-randomized cohorts, uh, you should you should always use Robin's I tools. That's one that's well established, and you can look up what uh, exactly that might entail. For randomized trials, they've also developed another tool called a Rob two. So they've pretty much covered uh, all the bases there. Uh, there are some other tools that you can use. Uh, the one that I know about is the NHLBI tool. Uh, so that's great for case series and case reports sometimes, but generally the Robins and Rob2 are considered the gold standards that you want to use. Okay, uh, so a quality review like uh, everything else you've done so far is going to use a table to uh, sort of sort the data and they'll in, in that table you'll have your specific domains of bias. And I'll show you a picture of what that looks like but generally with those domains of bias you'll determine whether the bias in a particular study was serious, moderate, or low 
Um, and the website, which gives Robin's, the Robin's Eye tool or the Rob2 tool, will usually have an instruction guide on how you systematically should judge each of these domains. So it's not just how you feel about that particular domain, but it's, there's a way to do it. And that's included in the documents they have. So I've listed out the domains for you here. Uh, generally, it makes sense. You want you usually want to assess confounding, part, how the person was selected, et cetera, you know, uh, to determine if the quality of that paper was good. Um, the original quality assessment table that you've put as uh, for serious, moderate, or low for each um, domain should be included in either your main manuscript or in the supplement. So it should be included somewhere in there. You can't not include this final table. Okay. Um, all right. So in terms of that, that's pretty much it for the quality review and for assessing um, uh, for how to conduct the study. Uh, but once you've conducted the study, you want to think about the publication, like where am I going to publish uh, this paper and like how, what are my interests here? Um, and once you've written your manuscript and sort of wrote up your entire uh, paper, uh, you and your supervisor will both decide on what journal you want to target. And generally, like it's not the only metric of how well or how, cited, or how well cited or how difficult it is to publish in a paper. Uh, impact factor is a good way of uh, sort of having a good starting point. Um, NEGEM is usually the highest um, journal for uh, impact factors. They have an impact factor of 74.7, and generally undergrad papers do not publish in NEGEM. Um, uh, same with JAMA, which is also 56. and um, the Annals of Internal Medicine is, is also like 25. So like generally like 74 is just ridiculous. 25 is among the top tier already as well. So it also looks like a big difference. It's all in the super high tier of, of uh, prestigious journals. You Students tend to publish in impact factor journals of one, two, five, depending on the topic. Publishing in five and above is very, very good. Um, and generally I tend to publish around a one to three area. Um, your PI may want to start by submitting to high impact journals and, and you can do that. And sometimes they gradually move toward the lower ones if it doesn't work out. Um, the success which you have with the journal will depend on a few things. You, you may think it depends almost entirely on the quality of your message and reporting and while that's very important and what you can do for it, there's also other things that really determine if they'll accept it. And, and the main thing I think actually is if uh, the topic and the, is, is something that they're interested in. If the scientific community really likes that particular topic, then they will publish um, that uh, that topic. So for example, now they'll publish, of course, all the COVID papers when the COVID paper 10x came on. So it depends on really what their interests are and also your alignment of your papers. Take a look uh, at what the other studies the journal publishes as well and see if it's aligned with those papers. Okay. So publications, of course, take a long time. You should always expect the, the process of submission to take several months. Uh, once you sort of identify a um, a target journal, uh, what will happen is that uh, there's a lot of formatting to be done to make sure that the journal is acceptable, their paper is acceptable for that particular journal. And it could be very small things like I want the abstract to be structured this way, I want the word count to be this, and there are certain things that you'll have to pull from the instructions for authors on their website. And you should usually find that in a PDF document. Uh, with your PI, you'll also write a cover letter and suggest possible reviewers that you want for them to look at your paper. Um, so you either your PI will know some or you may take some authors from the papers they've already included. Then you'll submit to the journal and wait for a reply. This usually takes around one to three months for the first reply. So there are a few key players that are involved in the review of your paper. Um, the primary one is the chief editor. So that editor will, will basically have the final say on whether this paper will be published, but there will also be peer reviewers. And that's what gives the journals validity. That's what makes the journals high impact and uh, rigorous is because they use external reviewers or experts in the field to look at your paper. And their reviews will inform the chief editor of whether or not to accept these papers. So it won't just be bias um, based on one person. So the peer reviewers uh, will look at them, provide comments, and then send those comments the chief editor who will then consider the reviews and decide if the paper should be published in their journal. With that, uh, this, um, you'll see the status of your paper uh, on the platform you submitted to in three possible areas. It'll either be with the editor, so that's the first, they'll make, he'll first make an, or she will first make an initial decision on whether the paper is even worth reviewing at all, and sometimes they can send it back before they even send out to reviewers if they don't decide it's high impact. Then it'll go to under review where external reviewers will look at it. And then finally, it'll come back to the editor and he'll look at, or she'll look at all the reviews and then it'll make a final decision to you. Okay. Um, and in terms of journal choices, there's a couple of things that can happen. You can either get minor revisions or major revisions. Um, with these two, like they're generally positive and favorable results. Um, what that means is that uh, the journal wants you to make some corrections and then they'll consider it and they may send it back to reviewers or the editor, editor may look at it. But it'll, most, of, most of the time they'll accept the, the paper that's been submitted if you make the revisions and do a good job on it. 
the other two options are less favorable. Uh, invite by invite, uh, reject by inv uh, invite resubmission means that usually means that the reviewers um, didn't like the paper or didn't think that it was acceptable for uh, publication, uh, but they invite you to try. It. The editor believes that it has some potential, so if you make some modifications, they can send it back. And reject means that they don't believe it's suitable for publication uh, at all. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll talk now about uh, like this is sort of a graphic that summarizes what um, I've already discussed, and it sort of gives an idea of how much time you can expect uh, for a paper to be published. And um, the, the way it works is that's like I mentioned earlier, like when you submit it and the uh, chief editor sends out to reviewers, that process usually takes about one three, to three months. Um, hopefully it should only take about one month, depends on how fast reviewers are and getting back to you. But sometimes it can take up to three, so you should expect at least three months for that. Um, after that, uh, the editor will be sent back to the editor and this step doesn't take that long. The editor basically looks into revi revisions and they will usually know whether or not they want to accept the paper or not. Uh, so that usually only takes a week. Um, after that, uh, the authors have a chance to complete the revisions and that really depends on how long you want to put in the effort or how much time you can um, spend to doing the reviews. I find I always take at least a month um, depending on the deadline they give me. So usually one month is what I say. Um, after that, uh, you'll send it back to the reviewers and the editor and they'll decide if you did a good job on it. And that usually takes about a month, depending on how fast the reviewers are. Uh, the, I, I think that one month is usually the upper limit of how long it'll take. It should hopefully take less than that, uh, but usually one month is expected at least. Um, and then finally, um, what will happen is that if all is favorable and if it's been accepted and they like the paper, uh, what will happen is that you're really at the last step of your submission. And when you resubmit it again, uh, the editorial staff usually send it a few times back and forth for some formatting changes. And this is very minor things like, oh, like, did the, is the abstract structured properly? Is like, do you use keywords properly, like title page, et cetera. So that's, you can expect a few more back and forths for about, um, and for some changes that may take about a month the most uh, to do as well before they can find actually process it and submit it for publication. Okay. So in summary, uh, this is sort of, some of everything that I've discussed, but for the bottom line to know uh, for undergrad and med students that uh, there's a lot of pros to doing systematic reviews. The main thing, I think the biggest pro is that you, the author, controls the pace of it and how much time and commitment you put into it depends on that will determine the outcome. And uh, I think that's the biggest advantage to systematic reviews. You're not dependent on a lot of external factors. You're dependent. You're driving the project forward, and this can be done uh, online and virtual usually, and doesn't require any specialized lab, and you don't have to go in every day. Uh, so I think that those are huge pros as well, especially if you're doing school on the side. Um, another thing is that actually people don't think about a lot is that you may be able to involve your peers as second reviewers. It's always good that when you're working on a project to involve uh, your colleagues to help them not only get the experience on it, but also help them have it for their CV as well. Um, some of the bad things, though, is like you can usually expect one to two years before any results or outcomes. Systematic reviews are not completed in, in a month. You definitely need at least, I would say most reviews I've done taken at least a year, if not longer. Um, and the data collection and screening can be very long and arduous. It's extremely annoying to screen so many papers and, it, ta and it, it takes a lot of time and uh, focus to sort of just review that minutia over and over. So like, you, you, it does get a little boring at times. But uh, when the results come in and finally, like the overall pool, when you pull all the findings together, that's usually a bit more exciting. Um, something else to note is that you won't get any experience, of course, work in a lab with like cell cultures or mouse or anything. And like, and if that's something you're interested in, like you, I don't think systematic review is usually a great way to pursue that. Uh, you should try to get involved in the wet lab. And finally, that if you and your PR work on a topic that doesn't have much interest in it, or you don't believe it's a lot of is needed topic at this time, it's going to be very difficult to publish. And you tend to publish in much lower impact factors, uh, or if you have a negative result, um, that also can lead to more difficulty publishing your paper. Okay, so that's pretty much it for the presentation. I've left my email uh, here as well, and also, uh, so if you guys have any questions at all or anything you want to contact me about, uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, this video is also going to be posted, I believe, so you can also sort of go back and rewatch any components of it. And I believe that the PowerPoint will also be posted. Uh, so yeah, so feel free to sort of shoot me an email, answer any questions that you may have. All right, thanks for having me, guys.